one of our uh, illustrious former professors, uh, Richard Erickson, waved to everyone. Richard Erickson um, brought this to my attention. So I will just share with you uh, this picture, which, you know, there's one in every classroom in all of our business classrooms, and there's one when you walk into the School of Business, right? Well, did you see our speaker in this picture? Oh. Right? So this right here is our speaker. And doing one with the concept of business was actually his idea. So uh, the famous Nathan Green uh, painted this at the Holy Spirit inspired <laughs> prompting um, to Mr. Danny Houghton. So Mr. Houghton is uh, an alum here. He graduated from Southern Adventist University with a degree in religious studies. Uh, went immediately into business because those two go right, you know, always go hand in hand. And then he worked for a while and decided to get his MBA. He's currently the chief customer office at a large company based out of Canada. And I know he's going to share with you more about that. So if you would please warmly welcome Mr. Danny Howard. Well. Good evening. It is a, a real pleasure for me to be here and to spend some time uh, uh, with you this evening. And I hope it's an interactive time. We want to make sure we leave some time for questions. And I want to tell you a little bit about uh, my journey. I used to sit in these same chairs. Well, maybe they were chairs that were older than these. But um, really love my time here at Southern and, and um, have been blessed with some, with some neat uh, experiences that I want to share with you today that hopefully will be... Uh, um, fun and, and interesting to talk about and also stimulating for you as you as you think about and contemplate uh, your business uh, your business career the focus of our presentation this evening is going to be entrepreneurship um, I'm going to share a number of, of kind of anecdotes and stories that are shared with you know that are paired with biblical principles that I believe will be really really helpful to you as you're looking at your own career maybe whether it's starting a business or not um, I think that these uh, principles will be very, very applicable to you. So um, what we're going to do tonight is, is talk about some top tips uh, for entrepreneurship uh, success. Uh, Stephanie had shared a little bit about me. Um, as I, this is my family, I, my beautiful wife, Sandra, and our son, Andrew. He's 22 months old. Um, he's the one that kind of keeps me sane and allow me to, allows me to check out from work in the evenings when I come home. Um, as she shared, my, my undergraduate degree was not in business, actually. I had a minor in business, but I actually studied um, religion or religious studies and then paired that with an MBA from the University of San Diego, our Catholic friends. Oh, I'm supposed to turn on the mic. I have two of them. You'd think I'd remember, right? Can you hear me now? Yes. A little bit better? Thank you. So <clears throat> that's just a, a, a very brief uh, sketch about me. This is where I work. Uh, Silver Hills Bakery. Silver Hills Bakery is actually a company that is celebrating its 30th anniversary this year. Um, it consists of three different customer brands. The first one is Silver Hills Sprouted Bakery. We, we make organic uh, sprouted grain breads. Um, the second one on the far right is called Little Northern Bakehouse. That is a gluten-free um, line of baked products. Really been an exciting company that's accelerated very quickly. Launched three years ago. It's already the largest gluten-free um, brand in the nation of Canada. And we're also the number two brand in the natural and organic space here in the United States. Um, One Degree Organic Foods is kind of our premium brand. That is a brand that I co-founded uh, with my partner and launched. Um, it is a very unique brand in that we, we actually allow a customer on the shelf that picks up a box of our cereal or a loaf of our bread to meet the farmer that grew every single uh, ingredient in any product that we sell. That's the reason for the name. One degree of separation between the farmer and the customer. Um, and um, I'll, I'll share a little bit more about this company and then, then we'll jump in. I actually helped build uh, or oversaw the building of a num with a number of, of programmers of a, a special custom software product that allows you to scan a QR code on an, any box of cereal or any product we have and pull up a profile that matches the ingredient deck. So if you look at any ingredient in any uh, of our products, you can click on it. You can see here where it says like whole oats and the name of the farmer. And you'll be able to watch a 30 to 45 second video or look at a photo essay to meet the farmer that grew your food. And the concept is, is to kind of shrink and, uh, and allow people to know who grew their food, how they grew it, 
and be able to say, yeah, that, that's, I subscribe to the way that they grow their food and I'll put that in my body. Mm -hmm. Basically allowing people to, to make healthy choices for what they put in their body. So we try and make it super easy. If you have a, a, you know, a QR code scanner on your smartphone, you can do that. And so that was really the, the, the company that I co-founded and launched, and you'll hear me tell a, a couple of anecdotal stories about it. So one of the privileges of founding this company was the travel that came with it. How many of you like to travel? So founding this company has allowed me to travel now. I'm, I'm actually on my 50th country. And um, we would actually document our entire supply chain, you know, whatever, wherever we needed to go to document it. And it required us to actually think a little bit differently about our supply chain. So instead of just saying, hey, I'm going to need 50,000 pounds of wheat, I'll call a broker and order it in, I had to say, what farmer do we know that we've documented that we can order from that has supply that can bring it in and make sure it's matched through our entire supply chain? Now, it sounds convoluted and more challenging, and it is, but it gave us a very unique selling advantage out in the marketplace because no one else was doing it. And so, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about some of those examples as well. So that's, that's one degree organic food specifically. And I've, I've queued up, it's about a three minute video to just give you an example of one of the, the site visits we did to, to look at organic olive oil in the country of Tunisia. So take a look. Here in the North African country of Tunisia in the city of Sfax, it's an ancient city if you're looking for organic olive oil that's harvested in the traditional way, join us on this journey. To ensure the olive oil meets one degree's high standards, family member Danny Howe and general manager Rick Warner talked with everyone in City Chobu, from the president to the field board. My name is Ahmed. I was born here in 1953 and have lived with the olive trees all my life. Since I was young, my father taught me how to work with the olive trees, a skill that he learned from his father. Now I will teach what I have learned about agriculture, olives, and olive trees to my children, and they will teach it to theirs. Growing, harvesting, and producing olive oil is woven into the fabric of life in Tunisia. I have a passion for working with olives and derive a great joy from it. Just the smell of the olives and the look of the oil flowing like liquid gold throughout the process is very gratifying. I love my job, and it's a real pleasure to share it with others. Organic olive oil has been a tradition in Tunisia for over 2,000 years. Olive oil, you can find it in other countries, Spain, Italy, Greece, where you want to go. But organic in Tunisia is very particular. Do you know that in Tunisia, we have sun during 310 days per year. There is uh, no insect because it is dry weather. If we, there is no insect, we don't need insecticide or pesticide. When the consumer take this product, means there is Tunisian love. You can find it here. You, you can find the, the good weather. Uh, our sun, believe me, in all the world, you can never find sun like in Tunisia. And when, when you take this one, you, you can think about Tunisia in your uh, asset. When you put olive oil in the delicious dishes, that means that we have all uh, positive things in Tunisia in your dishes. All what we have is the sun and olive oil and some dates. This is Tunisia. And we have big heart also. <laughs> Tunisia's long-standing tradition of olive oil was a joy to witness and very much in line with one degree's commitment to clean foods. We are proud to use this organic olive oil in our products. So that just gives you a sense. Now that's a, a longer form one that we, uh, that we have on our website. We have little 30 second clips that you can see on your phone. And that's an example of one of the ingredients we have. Actually, they sell their olive oil in Costco. So if you ever buy an olive oil, check out on Costco. It's, it's, it's phenomenal um, olive oil. So that just gives you a flavor of, of the, the, the one degree organic foods um, uh, company. What I want to do now is I want to pivot and I want to talk about a couple of very, very specific principles that I believe are going to be very, very helpful to you, whether you're just in business or you're more interested in entrepreneurship and starting your own, your own business. And the first one I want to talk about is, is preparation. And I love this quote, success is where preparation and opportunity meet by Bobby Unser. And I want to, I want to start by telling you a little bit story, a, a little story about how we started One Degree Organic Foods. Um, we took a year and a half before we ever sold a product to build the software that allows us to, to share the transparency 
um, that we offer to our customers. So we went through extensive you know, visioning, storyboarding, building out the software, bug testing it, getting it done, year and a half. We took another six months to actually go out and film all of the farmers that were going to make up the core group of, of ingredients for our first set of products. Then we had to go through a process of innovation to actually make the products themselves and rush that all in a time frame for a launch for, for the largest um, food company uh, show that we have nationally every year. It's in Anaheim, California, it's in March. And so we had this huge focus of doing all this stuff. It took us almost two years before we could ever show a product for the first time to a customer. So we went through this tremendous amount of work. We rented this little booth, showed our products for the first time, had the QR code there, we tested it, and we were open for business. Fifteen minutes into the show, I had a show organizer stop by and she said, I'm looking for new things. Show me what you have. And because of all that work we had done, I was able to pick up my phone and scan it and say, look at this and show her that and she said, I've never seen anybody that has done something like this before. And she says, hold on a second, I'm going to send somebody else to come see this. And before you knew it, I had a stream of people from the, from the organization that was putting on the show that wanted to see what we were doing. And so I very patiently showed all of them. I thought, this is, this is kind of cool. Turns out they were looking for specific companies to give uh, an award, a, sh a show award to called the Nexty Award basically what's coming next in food. And uh, we thought, well, this is pretty cool. So we found out that we were going to be nominated as one of 51 companies out of about 3,000 for this award. Eight, eight weeks later, we found out that we won that award. And that put us into another kind of PR funnel that allowed us to, to have access and, and um, uh, discussions with a number of clients that got us up and running. My point in sharing this with you is that without that preparation, without that two years of work, I would have not had the ability to, at the right time, be able to scan that to someone that was critical that I did not know uh, was, was going to be someone critical for the launch of our company, but it was because of that preparation. That's why I love this quote, success is where preparation and opportunity meet. Now there's a really cool story from scripture that talks about preparation, and I want to go through this very quickly, but King Jehoshaphat, you know, he inherits a kingdom, has a number of enemies around him, but look at the steps that he takes to prepare for any challenge. He obliterates idol worship from his kingdom. He establishes systematic instruction of the holy scriptures in his realm. And Ellen White tells us that to this wise provision for the spiritual needs of his subjects, Jehoshaphat owed much of his prosperity as a ruler. He sets up judges through his kingdom, so if you have an issue with your neighbor, you need to have something fixed. You know, and there's a court of appeals that goes with that. He makes them an economic powerhouse. So he brings a lot of trade and, and um, you know, crops and things of that nature. So there's an economic heartbeat that he encourages. And then he builds a number of different fortresses and storage cities to make sure that he's prepared in case there's ever an issue. And um, I'm sure many of you know the story. Uh, a number of the cousins, so the Ammonites, the Moabites, and the Edomites all get together and they decide they're going to take Jehoshaphat out. And instead of relying on all the preparation that he's done, he says, you know, we need to pray about this. And so he, he calls a convocation in the temple, and they begin to pray and ask God and say, Lord, we need your help. You know, we're in trouble here. And um, a Levite stands up and prophesies. The Holy Spirit, you know, prompts him to prophesy. And he says, you're not even going to need to fight, okay? Even though you've done all this preparation, you're not even going to need to fight. And Jehoshaphat, showing his faith, says, all right, we're going to put the choir out in front of the army to prove his faith, and out they go. The Lord turns the tribes against each other. They basically are able to walk in and be able to take the spoil. They never have to fight. And what I love about you know, that story, and, and I'll come back to this quote, Jehoshaphat was a man of courage and valor. For years he had been strengthening his armies and his fortified cities. He was well prepared to meet almost any foe, yet in his crisis he put not his trust in the arm of flesh, not by disciplined armies and fenced cities, but by a living faith in the God of Israel, could he hope to gain the victory of these heathen who boasted of their power to humble Judah in the eyes of the nation? So he prepared as best he knew how, and then he relied completely on God for the outcome. And you can see what God did for him after that victory. It says, then the realm of Jehoshaphat was quiet, for his God gave him rest all around. Another story of Joshua, and, and this is from Joshua 10. 
Many of you know the story of the conquest of southern Canaan where the Gibeonites come and trick Joshua into making a treaty with him, pretending they're from a long ways away. They make the treaty and then they go back and the rest of the cities in their area are very upset with them. Hey, you just, you know, you just signed up with the enemy. So they decide to attack them. And Joshua, you know, they send a message, messenger to Joshua and say, hey, you signed the treaty, come and protect us. So Joshua marches all the way through the night to protect these guys that they were supposed to wipe out. Notice this quote from Ellen White in Patriarchs and Prophets. Joshua had received the promise that God would surely overthrow these enemies of Israel, yet he put forth as earnest an effort as though success depended upon the armies of Israel alone. He did all that human energy could do, and then he cried in faith for divine aid. If you don't remember anything else from this, um, I want you to remember this line. The secret of success is the union of divine power with human effort. Those who achieve the greatest results are those who rely most implicitly upon the almighty arm. Tips on preparation. Number one, you want to give your absolute best effort. And number two, you want to rely completely on God for the outcome. Okay, and now there are ditches on both sides of this. You know, when you work that hard, you tend to want to rely on yourself. Um, and conversely, if you haven't done all the work, you say, well, the Lord will take care of it. But it's really that combination of those two points that really give you an edge in preparing. And I believe correlates directly into the business world. All right, I love this picture. Disruption is coming. <clears throat> so this is our second point. I like this quote as well. Fate whispers to the warrior, you cannot withstand the storm. The warrior whispers back, I am the storm. So coming back to the, to the, the story of our launch of One Degree Organic Foods, um, so we went through this, you know, kind of PR blitz that we were able to get as a result of this show. And what the typical progression is for a, for a food company is to start in a geographic area and really build up sales there as a, as a record to be able to then move elsewhere. But because of the hit that we were able to have at this food show, we were able to secure a national broker and say, hey, let's go national right away. And part of why we wanted to do that is because we knew we had something that was special and unique and we wanted to get out into the market as quickly as we could as fast as we could before competitors could try and replicate what we were doing. And so um, my wife and I spent a good five or six months on the road. Um, we went and trained in every region of the, um, the United States and Canada. So we'd sit down, by the time we were done, we trained over 300 people on how to sell our products, saying, you need to come in, share our unique selling proposition, how we're different. They can meet every farmer, it's farm to table and we wanted to disrupt the entire market. So when they would sit in front of a buyer that could put this on shelf, they could say, no one else can do this. Here's why you should bring it in. And uh, we had real, real success with that strategy going national and hitting it really hard right out of the gate because we had a unique selling proposition that no one else had. The idea was to be disruptive. And whenever you're in an entrepreneurial environment and you're launching a company, this is a really key thing that you want to do. Be disruptive. Figure out how you can have something that's different and unique from what the competition has. <coughs> Scripture has some really, really neat uh, disruption stories. I'm going to only share one, and it's called the disruption of the early church. You know that after Jesus' death, many of the uh, disciples were hanging out in Jerusalem. In fact, he told them to wait there for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. But um, all of a sudden, they found themselves scattered or disrupted. Coming from Acts 8, 3 to 4, it says, As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere, preaching the word. In other words, there was a mass disruption that happened that really was critical to the growth of the church. Notice what Ellen White says here from Acts the Apostles, page 105. Forgetting that strength to resist evil is best gained by aggressive service, they began to think that they had no work so important as that of shielding the church in Jerusalem from the attacks of the enemy. Notice that it's a defensive posture. You know, in an entrepreneurial environment, you want to always be on the attack or be on the offensive to create some change or disruption. But look what, look what the Lord does. To scatter his representatives abroad where they could work for others, God permitted persecution to come upon them. Driven from Jerusalem, the believers went everywhere preaching the word. 
So you see the principle here of disruption. We know how the early church grew. It grew very, very rapidly as a result of this initial disruption. So this is something that um, is a real key part of an entrepreneurial venture, an entrepreneurial launch. And uh, we see scripture backing up that, uh, that specific uh, strategy. So tips on disruption. Identify the space where your unique selling proposition, what makes you special as a company, provides the highest disruption potential. And number two, push as hard as you can to maximize your window of opportunity. So once you create that unique thing, whatever that thing may be, man, hit it as hard as you can and create your advantage because there's always somebody else behind you trying to catch you. Okay? Good decisions. I like this slide because how do we know which fork is, it's, it's going to take? Do we know? Is it going to be Brexit or is the EU going to stay together? Come on, guys. Talk about the ten toes. It's, it, we, we know that the EU is not going to stay together from Bible prophecy, right? So look at this quote. It is in your moments of decision that your destiny is shaped. So jumping back into the, the trajectory of our company's growth, I'd gone through this huge training regimen. We'd trained all of these brokers. We'd been able to secure a lot of national space where we were able to put our products up on shelf. And um, all of a sudden, we'd done all this hard work, and now I realized I had to manage this massive group of 300 people to make sure they were doing the right thing. And I had not had a historical background in food, and I very quickly realized that I needed to figure out another way to handle this because it was too big for me. Well, the Lord was very kind to connect me with someone, um, a former vice president of General Mills. If you guys have ever heard of Cheerios, um, they make Cheerios. But he was responsible, had been a vice president, to, to actually sell all of their organic brands. And they had about 20 of them. But he left and started his own company. Um, it was a, sale, a contract sales organization that both did field sales on your behalf and would also give you business intelligence and, and data analysis and help you figure out how to best pitch and, and have a strategic component that you could bring into play, and they helped you manage that broker process. And, and looking back at, at um, the trajectory of our company's growth and looking at the decisions that were made, this was probably one of the best decisions um, that we made corporately as a group to say, we're going to hire these guys, and they really helped provide a major, they brought a sophistication and a strategy that we didn't have as a, as a growing organization to help us continue to fuel um, our growth. And so, that, that decision, when you look back at that, you say, you know, Lord, thank you for that opportunity. And then, again, continue to work as hard as you can as you engage this new, this new resource um, uh, to help you. So, just, just talking a little bit about how uh, Scripture kind of underscores the need to make good decisions. King David had just gone through a seven-year process of waiting for, for King Saul and the, the question over who was going to be king to be resolved by the Lord. Saul had died in battle, and all the tribes of Israel are sending all of their troops to inaugurate the king. And if you look at this in Scripture, I actually wrote it down here if you can see it, have all of these different troop levels that each one are sending, and they're kind of like, yeah, we're sending these, these many troops. And you know, the bigger tribes are saying, yeah, we, you know, Ephraim has 20,800, and so it's all this, hey, we're going to be supporting the king, and look how much we're supporting. But whenever you're looking at data, it's always interesting to look at the outlier. And the outlier here is the sons of Issachar. You notice the number? It's only 200. It's a little bit counter to what everyone else is doing. Look at 1 Chronicles 12, 32. And of the children of Issachar, which were men that had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do, the heads of them were 200, and all their brethren were at their command. So these guys are saying, rather than send our brawn down here, we're going to send the guys that are strategic. They have command of our troops. We'll send them whenever we need. But these are the guys, when you're going into battle, or you have a question of whether we should be going into battle or not, these guys understand how to give really, really good counsel. Bible commentary says these men of Issachar were men who had wisdom to understand the meaning of current events and were able to provide intelligent counsel. So when you're making good decisions, you want to be able to read what's going on around you, understand um, your marketplace and be able to make informed and intelligent uh, decisions. So another case study, this, this knew the times, when you look at the Hebrew, um, we have the story of, of King Ahasuerus and, and Vashti, and many of you know 
He asked her to come in and dance. She wasn't very excited about coming in to dance and said, I'm not coming. And uh, basically it caused a crisis in the empire because she had not obeyed her husband. And so we see the king looking and saying, hey, I need to have some counsel on how I should respond to this. And you can see, it says, the king was very wroth and his anger burned in him. Then the king said to the wise men, which knew the times, okay, that's the same phrase, what should we do? Uh, according to Queen Vashti, according to the law, because she's not performed the commandment of the king. So in both of these cases, you see that there is a group of, of people that are counselors that are going to give um, advice that's proper. You can see Bible commentary says, referring to these men, these are persons of learning and experience who were acquainted with precedence and knew what the proper thing would be to do on any particular occasion. Now sometimes when you're launching your own business, you face a situation you don't know what to do. And so you have to figure out a way, you know, in, in entrepreneurship we call it your gut. You know, how, what's your gut telling you? How do you define your gut? How do you get these data points to help you know what you're doing? How do you talk to other people that have done it before you? You know, you want to have the ability to educate yourself on current events and trends in your business sector. So understand what's happening. Utilize scripture as your precedent, which we're seeing here, and combine those two to properly frame a decision and provide intelligent counsel. Make a good decision. Super, super important because unwinding a bad decision can be a lot more work than making the right one. Right? Okay, I gotta get a drink of water quick here, sorry. <clears throat> Balancing the load. You know, entrepreneurs are doers. And uh, jumping back into the, the launch of our company, um, you know, I'd gotten this, this sales group in place that were starting to help us sell some more. Um, we were doing these trips going out and documenting these farmers. We're also attending trade shows. I'm going on key customer calls still. There was one point where one year I was on the road 274 days. I hope I never have to do that again as long as I live. It was crazy. But um, I began to realize that if we were going to be successful, I couldn't do all this by myself. And we needed to put some structures in place that would help us with that. Albert Einstein said, life is like riding a bicycle. To keep your balance, you must keep moving. So I knew we had to keep moving, and I was the one that was trying to provide all this impetus. But I, I began to realize that this was not something that I could do by myself. And we needed to in, you know, engage some other people, whether it was an R&D team, a business development team of our own, additional salespeople just to make sure we could spread the load, have some other people that could do some of these trips overseas, because I wasn't able to keep up. And so, in an entrepreneurial role, usually the founder is the one that wears a ton of different hats and is ultimately responsible for everything. But as you have the ability to spread the load, you need to think very, very carefully about doing that. One of the things that I like to do um, in the mornings is to actually exercise, and I listen to um, uh, the Bible uh, on audio as I'm walking or running, as well as the Spirit of Prophecy. And I came to the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. And you know, when you're reading the book and you read all of these lists of guys, you can kind of skip over them, but it's, it's a little bit tougher to do it in 30 second increments. And I remember thinking, should I be listening to all these begats? And I thought, you know what? It's scripture, I'm just gonna listen to it. And as I came to the point where Nehemiah was beginning to build the city of Jerusalem, I found a really interesting pattern that I want to share with you that I think illustrates this spreading the load uh, very well. As you know, Nehemiah was charged uh, by, by the king of Persia to rebuild Jerusalem. Now, if you think about rebuilding a, a, you know, a, a city today, imagine the complexity of that today. Now go back you know, thousands of years and think about how do you do this? It's a massive job. But look at what he does here. I found this very interesting. So when you look at all the people that he talks about helping him, look at these different groups that he went out and recruited. Local government, and I'm not going to read all of them, but you can see them there. So mayors of different towns, the surrounding cities, city of Jericho, the Tekoa, you know, the men of Gideon and Mizpah, the clergy, so he gets the high priest, he gets the Levites, uh, the Nethanim and other, other priests. Then he goes to the business people, okay, goldsmiths, perfumers, merchants. And then what I like, in front of the house guys, Basically, these are guys that are there that have built their own house, and hey, we need a wall too. He says, hey, you need, you need to help us as well. And they even had women. So there was this guy that didn't have any sons, only had daughters. He recruits them as well, and they're all engaged in helping build the wall around the city of Jericho. So he has this huge task he has to do. He says, I can't do this by myself. 
I'm going to go out and recruit all these different people to help me keep moving this task forward. Now what's interesting, you know, the, the existing uh, leadership did not want him to succeed. Okay? And that's similar to, to what you'll find in an entrepreneurial venture. There are people that have established businesses that don't want you to succeed. You're taking share from them. But you've got to stay focused and you've got to stay on the job. So here we see him you know, mentioning that, hey, these guys are coming and saying, come now, let us meet together. Basically, come down and lose that momentum that you've been able to create with all these groups of people. And what is Nehemiah's response? I'm doing a great work. I cannot come down. Why should the work cease? while I leave it and go down to you, Nehemiah 6.3. They tried this four times. Finally, you know, Nehemiah is sticking the course. They send an open letter that says, hey, you're going to rebel from the king and set up your own kingdom, which is designed to force him to stop. And even still, he doesn't stop. And he gets that, he gets that, um, you know, that wall built. I think it was 52 days. They got it done and closed. So he was able to accomplish the task that he was able to, uh, you know, that he was focused on doing. So tips on balancing the load, okay? Recruit and motivate a broad and multidisciplinary group to support the load, okay? Really, really important. People that you trust, people that are good at what they do, and don't stop until the work is complete. You'll lose your momentum, and um, uh, you don't want to do that. So balancing the load. Candor is queen, okay? I like this quote. Candor isn't cruel. It does not destroy. On the contrary, any successful feedback system is built on empathy, on the idea that we are all in this together. I got a frantic call from one of my employees saying, we're in trouble. Our largest client um, in the United States, a very big client of ours, we make product for them under their label rather than ours, had just called and said, hey, um, you made a mistake, a packaging mistake. Um, you put one product that's supposed to be in a certain bag in another bag. And so we went and did some research. We have cameras on our work lines, and we realized that one of our workers had taken some, uh, had not followed protocol and cleaned out the packaging that was automated, um, and we had run another product on top of it without cleaning it off, and somehow the bags had gotten mixed. And from our judgment on it, we thought it was somewhere around 20 cases, which, you know, a couple hundred dollars maybe at most. But our QA team had come back to us and said, we have a real problem because the bag that it went into has a different ingredient deck and there's an undeclared allergen in that bag that could kill somebody that has a severe allergen to it. And said, what do you want to do? And so we, we sat down and we talked about it as a leadership team and we realized that there were some real challenges. We had to do the right thing, but, but it was a private label product so no one else knew who this account was serviced by. So we were going to have to declare that it was us. We were going to have to do a voluntary FDA recall, which we had never done as a company before. And that was going to involve spending a huge amount of money to bring all the product back and destroy it, create new product. There was going to be a gap for the, for the retailer of probably at least three to four weeks, and they were going to lose millions of dollars in sales as well. And we said, well, we need to do this. So we got on the phone, and, and um, I, I was there with our chief operating officer. We kind of camped in our, in our um, boardroom for two weeks to oversee this. That's all we did. And uh, we, we called up our, our customer and said, look, here's the deal. And we laid it out exactly as we understood it and said, we're here to help you fix it. We realize it's going to be a problem. It's going to cost a lot of money for both of us. But here's what we're going to do. We're going to do the right thing. And so we worked through that process together. We wanted them to know that we valued their clients. We did not want to put them in a situation uh, where they might have a, you know, somebody that eats one of these things that has an allergic reaction. It's a real problem. And it took us the full two weeks, and it was a seven-figure cost to, to actually go through this recall. But we, we decided we are going to be open. We are going to be transparent. We wanted them to understand um, that we were partners with them, and we were going to do what we could to take care of it. And you know, after we got done with that process, um, the, the vice president of that division called me up and he said, you know, you guys have been wonderful to work with through this. We appreciate your partnership and we want you to know it's going to be solid as can be moving forward. Because we did the right thing um, and they realized we were a team player, that we didn't beat around the bush. We told them straight how it was. It ended up being an advantage for us even though it was a huge hit uh, to the bottom line. We see several cases of candor in scripture. And the one that I want to draw your attention to is the story of David and Nathan. 
Um, Nathan the prophet was actually someone who was very close to David. Uh, when David decided he wanted to build the sanctuary, he said to Nathan, do you think the Lord uh, would allow me to do this? And Nathan says, yep, I think you should do it. Um, that night the Lord comes to him and says, you shouldn't have told David that. Go back and tell him he's not going to be the one to build it, but his son will. So Nathan at different times wasn't always very direct and, and saying, hey, you know, need to have some candor on this. But in this specific case, David goes in and he takes the wife of one of his soldiers, Bathsheba. He actually kills her husband and then takes her as his wife. And Nathan goes in and he tells a story to, to illustrate a point to the king. And he's very, very direct in what he says. And I want you to notice this. He finishes telling the story about these sheep and the, the rich man taking a, a, you know, a sheep from the poor man who only has one. It says, Then Nathan said to David, You are the man. Now that may not sound like a big deal, but remember David is the most powerful king in this realm. There's not a more powerful man you can be talking to. And uh, he goes in there unflinchingly and says, you're the man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I have anointed you as king over Israel. I delivered you from the hand of Saul. Why have you despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? You have killed Uriah the Hittite with a sword. You have taken his wife to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, behold, I will raise up adversity against you in your own house. And he does that. Notice what Patriarchs and Prophets says about Nathan. Nathan delivered the divine sentence unflinchingly, yet with such heaven-born wisdom as to engage the sympathies of the king, to arouse his conscience and to call from his lips the sentence of death upon himself. So he does this in such an artful way, uses a story to illustrate it, but, but doesn't mince words and comes right to the point, shows candor in his exchange back and forth with the most powerful man in the kingdom. So tips on candor. You want to seek the truth. This is one of the things we talk about in our organization. We don't care if it's bad news. We want to know what the truth is so we can accurately diagnose it. Please share with us exactly what any issues may be. Number two, speak plainly and directly. Don't beat around the bush. Come to the point. Say exactly what the issue may be. And then number three, most importantly, create a spirit of working together to fix the problem. My favorite, choosing right words. You know, one of the things that um, is a real challenge in the world of food is, is pitching to these retailers that have the ability to give you space on the shelf or not. And it's a, it's a very, very dynamic environment. Many times you'll walk in and they'll tell you, you've got an hour um, to present. And so you create a, you know, a huge presentation like this. And then when you walk in, they're like, sorry, we're running behind today. We had a bunch of people. You've got 10 minutes. Pull it together. Um, other times you'll be able to walk in and, and you're given a part and you don't know what's coming before or behind. So you have to have the ability to adjust and adapt on the spot, read the situation, understand what the buyer is trying to do, and try to adapt and use your time as efficiently as you can. Um, I had the privilege of talking to a Costco buyer from Northern California once to pitch one of our One Degree products. One of the toughest exchanges I've ever had as a salesman. I walked in had all this data, great presentation to share, um, showed data, said, hey, here's why you should be ordering this in truckloads from me, because that's what Costco does. We love Costco. Um, and so I lay all this out, and she looks at me, and she says, I don't think your product's going to sell. And I've had that told to me before, but, um, but she said, more than that, this QR code that you've got on the front, she says, I think that cost me money. I want you to take that off the box, and, uh, and then let's talk about it. You know, they're designed to figure out ways that cost gets embedded. And so, you know, I, I gently ab absorbed her, whatever you want to call it, feedback, and just kept on, you know, selling. And she came back in, she hit me again. Hey, get that off the box, then maybe we can talk. And so, you know, I, I decided at that point, you know, this is, this is a rude enough thing. I, I need to stand up and defend my product. And so I said, you know, what, what you're saying to me is very offensive because you're, you're actually taking the unique selling proposition and the value that I put in this product and telling me it's not worth anything. And I said, all I can tell you is, is that we've had a lot of clients that resonate with this idea of, of, of farm to table. I really believe it would work very well for you, but we're not going to be taking it off the box. And if you don't buy this, uh, you're going to be losing sales. And she was very abrupt. She said, thank you. Out the door, almost rude. And out the door I went and I thought, you know, I'm not getting anything from this one. And it was an important one. It was a critical one, a critical time. Strangely enough, three weeks later, POs show up for three truckloads of our product. She never called, never had any other questions. But the fact that I defended 
what the value of our product was impressed her even though she pressed me the way she did. And it was only, I, I believe it was only because I defended that that she was willing to, uh, to give us a shot and we did very, very well in that, in that, um, that Costco region. So a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver, King Solomon said. Um, I want to look at a case study from Jesus in dialogue. You all know the story of Nicodemus in, in the, the Gospel of John. And I want to just kind of go through this, this structure with you. And, uh, and notice how Jesus relates to, uh, you know, to, to Nicodemus. So Nicodemus says, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Now notice what Ellen White says this phrase was designed to, to kind of engender. His words were designed to express and invite confidence, but they really expressed unbelief. So, how does Jesus respond? Instead of recognizing the salutation, he came directly to the point. So he doesn't sit for this nice back and forth feel good thing, but Jesus says, hey, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So he cuts straight to the point, almost like a razor, and says, we're not going to do this back and forth thing. You really need to understand who I am, and let me walk you through how that is. And sometimes in business, you got to kind of cut through the red tape, and you got to say, look, you know, we're over here, but we need to be in this vein of discussion. And you need to bring the entire group there to do that, okay? But you have to have a level of emotional intelligence to know when exactly to do that. Now let's look at a, another case, again, of Jesus in dialogue that's different, okay? And, and I'm wanting to show the contrast here. And this is, this is after Jesus' resurrection. This is in Acts chapter 1. And um, his disciples are coming to him. This is right before he is, resur he's not resurrected, but he's uh, ascending into heaven. And he says, therefore, when they had come together, this is the disciples, they asked him saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Now, if you read anything about Jesus in his three and a half years with the disciples, you know that he's constantly trying to tell them. He, in fact, he point blank says, my kingdom is not of this world. The whole point all along is, there's a different frame we're looking at here, and you know, if this was a business case, you'd probably want to shake these guys and say, what's wrong with you? Why don't you understand this? And you know, Jesus had every right probably to do that, but notice his response. Jesus doesn't confirm or deny. He absorbs and he redirects. What does he say? Jesus said, it is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come, upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So rather than trying to focus and answer their question in a temporal way or say, come on guys, get with the program here, understand what I'm trying to do, he absorbs it and he redirects their focus. Okay, master tactician in understanding how to use words and to redirect the uh, attention to where it needs to be. Jesus is the very, very best at doing that. So, tips on choosing right words. Study how to answer. Proverbs 15, 28 tells us that. Learn to read the situation and the people that you are engaging. This is such a key piece of business. You know, walking into a room, understanding who the people are that are the decision makers, reading nuance, listen to what people are saying. Really, really important to listen. Listen how they're saying it, because that'll give you a sense of what exactly is happening. And then and then determine your response. Do you need to come back at them directly? Do you need to kind of have an indirect discussion and redirect them to a more effective line of discussion or, or thought, whatever the case may be? But this probably, from a business perspective, can be as valuable to you as, as anything you know, that we talk about. Understanding what people need, how to relate to them, and to move things along in a way that's, that's advantageous both for you and for them. Okay. We've zipped through these. We've got 15 minutes left for questions. Um, hopefully I didn't go too fast, but uh, hopefully this has been something that's been valuable for you, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Yes? Thank you for sharing about One Degree. Um, it seems like you are ahead of the curve in terms of sustainable development. Um, it's a huge trend for consumers, and it's, it's the ruling bodies like the UN talk about it. Um, so because you've been so ahead as a pioneer, what advice would you give us as future entrepreneurs or what would you say is rewarding about this outside of the fact that it's a trend 
um, or something that like ruling bodies like the United Nations says we should do in terms of sustainable ethical sourcing and such? Well, I think it's wonderful anytime you know, a body will give you direction like the UN or whatever the case may be that says well, this is the way we think it's going. But what we really try and focus on is to say what is the consumer demanding? What is the consumer interested in? Because at the end of the day in business, you know, consumers are voting with their dollars. Either they're giving you the empowerment to continue doing what they're doing or they're buying somebody else and they're empowering them. And so what we try to focus on is rather we want to listen to those large movements. You know, that's part of what we talked about, creating your funnel and, and understanding how to make good decisions. But we really focus on it on a micro level to say, you know, what are the trends telling us? People care about what they're putting in their bodies. They want to understand, is this going to be something that helps my, uh, my well-being or is it going to hurt me? And what we focus on is to say, how can we make food that's transparent, people know where it's coming from, provide as much nutrition as we know how to do, and eliminate as many toxins as we're capable of doing, and, and message that in an appropriate way to the customer. And when we do that, we find that we're, we're successful and the customers really resonate with that. So we're focused on saying, what are the buying trends? What are people interested in? Certainly there's correlation with some of the bigger bodies, but we want to say, that customer that's voting with that dollar, how do we get to them? So does that answer your question? Sure. Someone else? Yes. So how did you go from religious to medicine? All these religions. Was it jumping media or did you like think about it and just run with that? It's a great question. Um, a, a little bit about my background. When I first came to Southern, my plan was to take a degree in religious studies and do all my pre-med, uh, pre-recs, and become a doctor. I really enjoyed studying religion, always have enjoyed that, that area. And so that was my plan, but my sophomore year, I decided I didn't want to be doing that much school for that long. You know, medical school and then residency and all the things that go with that. And so I had a period of time where I wasn't sure what I was going to do. But I always enjoyed the religion. And so I finished that degree. My senior year I pivoted, um, picked up a business minor. I had worked in my dad's business from a very young age. And so when I, when I got out, I knew I didn't want to be a pastor. I knew I didn't want to be a, a chaplain. You know, those are the typical things that you do with that or a teacher. And so I took a job as an accountant right away. Um, at a hospital in uh, Laguna Beach, California. Very quickly figured out I did not want to be an accountant. Mm -hmm. They locked me in a room where I couldn't see anybody or talk to anyone. I'm a very highly social person. Um, but sometimes, you know, in your career process, you've got to cross off things that you don't enjoy, and that helps you understand where you are going. Um, I knew I wanted to do something in business, and so I went back and worked in a sales position working for my dad selling artwork by Nathan Green, and, um, and then worked on my MBA at night and uh, finish that up, I, I just jumped right in and, and figured out how to learn. So the other thing I'll share is each component that I learned in each phase of my career was actually something that I used when I launched uh, the company that I founded with, with my partner. So figuring out how to do television, I did that as a volunteer with uh, It Is Written Television, went out and did that for free to figure out how to put together a media plan. I knew how to do the software from working with my dad's company doing software. Um, I'd always enjoyed selling, so I, I put all those pieces together, and I couldn't have planned that um, on my own. But, you know, the Lord opens doors in specific ways, and as long as you work as hard as you know how to do, even if it's going to be for a short period of time, you're going to learn something that you'll be able to use later on. And that was, that was the case with me. So, yes? into our business. So there are a couple of things that we do that's very, very specific. So we're a family owned and operated company, so we have the ability to, to structure our business the way that we want. One of the things that we do is we never allow anyone to work on Sabbath. So even though at times our plant is really uh, pressed for, for um, production, we shut down two hours before Sabbath and we don't start up until an hour after Sabbath is done. Many times we're, we're going to the largest show of the year, 80,000 people, um, for all three of our brands uh, next week. Uh, we pay a lot of money to be in front of those people. We have, you know, quad booths. And it's a Thursday, Friday, Saturday show. We shut it down on Sabbath. And we actually have a little postcard that talks about the importance of rest, that, that uh, talks about our philosophy as a company. You turn it over on the back, and we have some scriptures from Genesis that talk about the importance of rest, 
Some of the, you know, I think it's in Numbers or Leviticus or Numbers where it talks about the importance of land resting, correlating that for the need for people to rest and that we're disciplined in doing that, sharing our faith in that way. So people that are walking by the booth coming to try and think they're going to, you know, buy something or learn about our products, we have the ability to witness to them in that way. And so um, those are just a couple of the things that, that we do. The other things, whenever we have corporate events, we always pray when we bless the food. We do that um, very, very consistently. We're very open with our faith and we, we see our our company as a platform to witness to the people that, uh, that we do business with. Really important. And I want to underscore that, you know, as, as you're in, in moving into your careers, please look at, at your, your career and your business as a platform to witness to other people because you have a unique ability to meet people that maybe a pastor is never going to be able to talk to. You know, I'll give you an example of that. Just last week, I was uh, visiting with the president of our, our brokerage company in Canada, very, very affluent guy, been very, very successful. He's 80 years old. And he struck up a conversation with me. He said, you know, I'm 80 years old. My boys are starting to take over my business. And I'm asking the question, is this all there is? And he's an atheist. And so I began to pray and I had a chance to have a very, very spiritual exchange with him um, that probably no one else would be able to have. And so um, it's going very well. We're, we have a dialogue going back and forth. I'm sending him some books, including The Great Controversy. But you, you know, the sphere of influence that you're going to work in, whatever area of business that you have, the Lord's going to be bring people into your sphere of influence that you will have the ability to talk to on a spiritual basis. And you want to prepare yourself for that. That's just as important as the business work that you do. In fact, it's probably more important. And to have the ability to answer in that way and to be a witness, um, you know, from the platform of business that you're in is, is super important. So great question. Thank you for that. Someone else? Yes. How do you distinguish between your passions as an entrepreneur and how did you decide that this, I'm assuming that how it was connected is your scripture is with your business. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming that um, you believe that God wants you in this field. Yeah. How did you decide on which passion to pursue as a, a whole career and a whole business? And then what are the, if any, It's a great question. Um, you know, there's a story in Scripture about Gideon and a fleece, you know, where he asks, hey, I want it to be wet with the ground dry, and then the next time I want it to be dry with the ground wet, you know, where you put out fleeces and you, and you ask the Lord as, as different situations present themselves. You look at it and you'll, you'll say a prayer and say, Lord, if this is a door you want to open, you know, make it clear. And, and in my case, you know, I had left the world of kind of the church work where I had done a lot of work um, you know, with, with different denominations. I had a great network there. And moving to this food world, I had zero network, which for someone that's starting a company, you know, a network's really important. And so I just said, Lord, we're going to try this. And if, if it's your will, help me to connect with the right people. And um, I can look back and say very specific points in time, whenever we needed something specific, you know, a broker. The Lord brought us one of the best brokers for the natural channel, the organic and healthy food, a national broker exactly when we needed it. Exactly when I needed to have the sales organization, I met this VP from General Mills. So as we continued to grow, you know, we did all the work and we said, Lord, help us understand where we need to be going next. And every time we would do that, he would open a door and he would show us somebody else that we need to be connecting with. So, you know, you, you kind of put yourself in, in a position to say, Lord, show me where you want me to go. And, you know, if you ask him that with a true heart, he'll, he'll show it to you. And, and he did that for me. So, there was a question back here. Oh, yeah. So, as an entrepreneur, um, what factors or disciplines do you have when you um, decide what ideas are worth investing in? It's a really good question. Um, you ever seen the movie Shark Tank, or the, the, tr the show Shark Tank? Yeah. Anyone like to watch that show? I love to watch that show. <laughs> One of the things that you see them ask on a regular basis of all the people that are pitching their ideas, how much have you sold? How much have you sold? And, and that question really is, has the market validated your idea to a degree that we think that it can translate at the next level? And so what you do is you try and figure out a way, an efficient way to test and see if your idea works or not. It's a proof of concept, right? Can we prove the proof of concept or the idea that we're trying to execute? And can you do that in an efficient way that shows results that will confirm that your idea is the right one to pursue? So 
What I would say to you is, is figure out how to, to get a proof of concept. And what will happen is, by executing the proof of concept, you're going to get in the weeds. You're going to figure out how to do this. And you know, both the market feedback and your knowledge and space of what it is you're trying to do are going to give you the answer as to whether or not it's a good idea. Someone else? Got a couple minutes left? Yes? I'm sure the answer to that is yes. Give me a second to think about it. Um, yes. Um, so, and this is kind of an interesting story, but um, we were pressing really hard to try and find an organic source of quinoa. And um, we were down in Argentina. We were documenting a couple of different ingredients. And um, I had this broker I was trying to work with. I said, we have to have this certain kind of spec. We were pushing really hard to try and get it for a launch of a product. So we flew straight from Argentina to Peru, and uh, we go up and we do this whole documentation. And while I'm filming, asking questions of the farmer through a translator in Spanish, I ask him a specific question about how he grows his crops. And um, he answers in, in a way that I know all the work that we've done, everything we've done to document it, come all this way, spend all this money, we're not going to be able to use them. And um, I thought, you know, Lord, maybe I was just pressing a little bit too hard on this one. We need to probably pack it back in and find another source. And so sometimes, you know, you, you can run into situations where you can press and, and maybe you skip something you don't realize and it kind of stops. And, and you just say, Lord, you know, open that door if you want me to go that direction. But if not, show me, you know, close the door but open the window. And so come back and say, all right, that didn't work. Let's, let's put it back together and bring this before the Lord again and say, what direction do we need to be going? So, does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Anyone else? Yes. What's your favorite book of the Bible? My favorite book of the Bible? Um, that's a tough one. I, I, really, I really enjoy the book of Joshua, and that might be a strange one. But when you talk about leadership, you look at the, the story of Joshua, he was a phenomenal leader. You know, and, and he had his ups and downs. Um, you see him at some weak points. You see him at some tremendously strong points. He had a very tough job. And um, yet in spite of all that, he persevered. You know, you see idolatry coming in towards the end of his life. He saw that coming. You know, but he, he made a conscious call to the people, especially at the end of his life. You know, choose you this day whom you will serve. You know, come on, guys. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And I think when you look at the definition of a leader, and there are many of them in Scripture, but I really love the story of Joshua. Um, he was a very active guy. He was a strategic guy. He knew how to put coalitions together. He was a man of action. Um, but he relied really uh, strongly on the Lord. There would certainly be others, but Joshua's one of my favorites for sure. Thank you so much.